Well, praise God. Welcome to Word Time. This is Coach Shelby with Coach for Christ. And I uh, wanted to share a quick word with you guys, probably because of all the snow and everything going on. Um, people kind of locked in. Yeah, we ain't locked in. Shoot, we just go snow sledding. Amen? Amen. There ain't nothing out there that can stop us from doing what God has called us to do. Praise the Lord. Somebody said, thank you, Jesus. Uh, turn with me real quick, if you would. Uh, we're going to talk about the narrow way, about the, the difficult path. But before we do that, um, I want to read to you a psalm, and I want to go back to Psalm 18. And I want to tell you the reason why that we pray, okay? Um, praise God. What do you think about this pulpit? Pretty nice, ain't it? Praise God. Right here in the spare bedroom, prayer room, Holy Ghost room. Of course, the Holy Ghost goes everywhere. It goes everywhere you go. If you've been born again, say you feel with the Spirit of the living God. But it says in the Word of God, in Psalm 18 and in verse 6, I was trying to find my place there. It says very clearly, it says, In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cries came before him, even to his ears. So the reason why that we pray is because God hears us. That's the reason why that we pray. We pray because God hears us. And I think that that should be an obvious, but... If it was so obvious, then why are God's people not praying? There's a couple of different things there that I don't want to allude to. I, want, I don't want to get into concerning salvation and whatnot. But if you really believe God's word, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, and you believe that God said in 2 Chronicles, I believe 7 and 14, that if my people will humble themselves and pray, if they will seek my face, if they will turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal their land. If my people, you see, he didn't say everybody. He said, if my people, and I suspect that some of the people that may be watching are God's people. So if God's people would pray, then we'd turn this thing around. You see, my prayer is not that, uh, and it kind of was at first, and everything's going on in our nation, that we would rise up, stand up, bear arms, and say, hey, let's go giddy up like our forefathers did, like pastors, men of old who were leaders in the military, and said, no, we're not going to, we're going to stand against tyranny. We're going to stand... But our prayer, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God. We're pulling down strongholds. 2 Corinthians 10, start 4, 5, and 6. We cast down imaginations. We cast all of that down. We are not of the flesh, my brethren. Dead people don't rise up and fight in such ways. You see, dead people are led by the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost speaks the word of God. He cries out. If we believe that God heard us, then we'd be praying. Now, if you'll turn with me real quick again to Matthew in chapter 7, I want to bring something to your attention, something I shared in a Bible study last week. Simple message, but we need good, simple reminders sometimes. Sometimes we get too complicated in the Word of God because we want to show how intelligent we are, which we really show our ignorance because the flesh is even involved in that. Without the enlightenment and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, you've got nothing to say. you got people standing around, and I'm not talking to you specifically, the Holy Ghost may be, but I'm not. Woo, wow, this, that, oh, he's so smart, he's so intelligent, his delivery is so good, all this kind of stuff. That shows you that you're judging by carnality. If the word of God goes forth, I said the word is anointed. David Wilkerson said this. He said when he was speaking, he said he was praying prayers that the word of God, that, that the message would be anointed. His wife told him, God spoke to him through his wife and said, the word of God is already anointed. Do you hear what I said? It's already empowered. It is the word of God. You see, the word of God is a person in John 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And not only was the word God, but the word still is God. And he became flesh in John 1, 14. The word is anointed. Christ, the anointed one. Did you hear what I just said? Did you gather all of that? So the word is already anointed. It's already there. So when God says that he hears our prayer, he's not lying. So why ain't we praying continually? Why don't we go to the book of Thessalonians and see that we, why don't we not pray without ceasing? Why do you think Paul, yet the Holy Spirit spoke to Paul and said, pray without ceasing? He says, pray without ceasing because God hears you. Now I can add that in there because of what I just read to you from Psalm 18. And I could pick up 10, 20, 30, 40 more verses that tell us to pray and that God listens to the prayers. He holds your tears in a bottle. He knows, he cares for you. So be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall encompass your mind, your will, your emotions, your soul, your body, your very fabric of who you are, your being, spirit, soul, and body. 
Now, I put the CST on there, Coach Shelby Translation. Everybody else has got a commentary. I might as well commentate as well, as long as the Holy Spirit approves of it, and I know he approves of that. Because we're not supposed to put our trust in anything or anybody but God. And any time that we put our trust in fear, lack of, lack of faith, any time that we're moved by our obstacles or the circumstances around us, then we're not believing that God hears us and we're not acting in faith. Because if we'd only pray, there'd be a faith that would begin to bubble up inside of us. Does John 7 not say that he who believes out of his belly, out of his innermost being, shall flow rivers of living water? Is that not what the Word of God says? I see you nodding with me. That's exactly what it says. So, in Matthew chapter 7, the narrow way, verse 13, it says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate. Enter by the narrow gate. See, Jesus is the gate. There's only one way. You have a wide path, and you have a narrow path. And the way I explain this when I was speaking to the kids is that if you've ever been out in the woods, which we out in the woods out here in Wise County, and you've ever run up on a game trail, even a rabbit trail, sometimes that thing ain't four inches wide. Sometimes less than that. And if you don't pay attention as you walk, it's easy to veer off that track and lose track of where you're at. It's easy to get lost. And if you don't pay attention, you might get bit by a snake representing sin. So you got to pay attention to the path. You see, the wide path is e easy. See, I can go walk down these roads, these neighborhood roads and these back roads, and I can wander around, look at the cows and the goats and the birds and all that. And I don't veer off that because it's, it's an easy path. But the narrow path takes someone to pay attention. It takes someone to be led of the Holy Ghost. Now, years ago, and many of you have heard this message, you know, I used to go into the, to the schools that I had an iPad and I had a hotspot, if y'all remember what those hotspot boxes look like. Now they're on our phone. And when I would go into the school at that time where I worked up in Denton County, my Wi-Fi signal would always go to the school when I was teaching. But if I wanted that message in completion to be able to get to the website, the Coach for Christ website, and do what I wanted to do in those Bible studies or in those FCA meetings, then I had to switch my signal back to my hot spot where there was no restriction. You see, the school had restrictions on it. You see, I had to pay attention. I had to do something with what God was giving me. You see, we got too many people to say, come up and say this prayer after me. And maybe indeed they did come to Christ, and maybe there was a heart transplant. But let me say this, because I say that loosely and lightly, because if there's a heart transplant, then there's a new desire in you. You see, the old scripture that says that God will give you the desires of your heart. You see, if your heart ain't his heart, <laughs> did y'all catch that? I'll let y'all fill it in, the, the mature that are watching, that are paying attention right now. Is God's heart your heart? You see, because his heart doesn't care about Lamborghinis. His heart don't care about a new flavor of the week. His heart don't care about what kind of house you live in, all that. You see, his heart is that people repent, be born again, and saved. That is the heart of God. So, back to Matthew 7 and 13. Enter, enter by the narrow gate. By the narrow gate. Now, I, I, I've got to show this to you while I'm here. And I, I do this because that's what God does to me sometimes. Praise God for that. Somebody said amen. In, verse, or in chapter 24, hold your place right there in Matthew 7. But in chapter 24, there's a couple of highlighted things I want to say to you. And I, I just felt led to share at this moment. And because... Lawlessness will abound. This is talking about the last days, the difficulty of the path that God has given us. Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. You see, if the love of God is in you, it can't grow cold. You see, it's my God. He says he's a consuming fire. Oh, it'd be good today on a hot, on a cold winter day. Lowest temperatures we've had in the times that I can ever remember right here in Texas. But the fire of God does not grow cold. God is love, the love of God in you, so it can't grow cold. If you stay on the path, it can't grow cold. And I won't teach on ways that one can be on the path and get off other than not paying attention at this time. As I move on in chapter 24, and I read in verse 36, it says, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. In verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Now, you do not know what hour. Watch, pay attention. Blessed is the servant, in verse 46, whose master, when he comes, finds him taking care of business. It says, will find so doing. Now, you can read the rest of that about the good steward, the good, the good servant. But the thing that intrigues me here is in verse 13 of chapter 24, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now, I want you to go back to that path that we were talking about. 
Go back to the gate. You've got to come through Jesus Christ. There's a lot of ways people trying to get to Jesus or, or trying to get to, to heaven without going through Jesus. But my Bible says in John 14, 6, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There's absolutely no way except through him. And Jesus is the word of God. He is anointed. And so if we're not following the prescribed order of God, which is through the cross of Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, 18, for the cross of the cross is the power of God unto us who are being saved, but it is foolishness to those who are perishing. The cross is the vehicle that God chose to use, the altar, if you will. And so if we're not coming through the cross, then we're, we're, we're imposters. We're coming the wrong way, and God's going to deal with that, and he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. We've got a lot of people preaching the gospel, and you can go on and read the rest of Matthew, and you will see in those verses and in those chapters that, that people will come and say, but Lord, Lord, and he says, depart from me, I never knew you. They may have come to the gate, but they didn't enter in, and they did, certainly did not stay on the path. It says, enter by the narrow gate. Jesus is that gate. Somebody, somebody ought to say amen on that. Somebody ought to say praise God. Jesus is that gate. And I know, boy, it's really hard if you ain't ever preached the gospel before to stay on track just for a second. But I'm going to read right here. I got me two Bibles right here. It's a two Bible day. Amen. In Luke 13, holding your place again in Matthew 7, please. In verse 24, it says, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Now, this is talking about, it, it even talks about a wedding feast and all those kind of things in this. And uh, it's a warning is what it is. Those that are not wearing the, the wedding clothes will be removed from the wedding feast. Matter of fact, they'll never even get in the door. There was 10 virgins, five didn't have oil in their lamps. They knocked on the door and the door was already shut. The master already shut the door. Remember, he who endures to the end shall be saved. But it says, strive to enter in at the straight gate. It's a straight gate. Jesus is that gate. Now, the word strive, and I think it's, it's amazing, there's four different things here. It says, as in entering a contest, contention in a gymnastics games, content with adversaries to fight, struggle with difficulties and dangers, antagonistic to the gospel, endeavor with strenuous zeal to obtain something, labor fervently. Did y'all catch all that? So this ideology that we have, this Americanized gospel, that we just say this prayer after me, oh Jesus, forgive me of my sins, and you're the son of God, and you died on the cross, and rule from the throne of my, of my heart, I give you my life, oh bless me, keep me, let's go eat and go live our best life now. They just think the rest of the story. You see, if a person is even born again, and there's been a heart transplant take place, there is a change in desire. There is a new nature, even a divine nature, that the Holy Spirit revealed to Peter. If you want to go back and read, go ahead and read both books of Peter. They're pretty short. There's a new divine nature in us. And that divine nature gives you everything you need. That same saving faith that the Holy Spirit drew you unto the Father is the same faith that it takes to walk this narrow path that Jesus explains here. Enter by the gate. Come through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, but narrow is the gate. Narrow is the gate. Narrow is the gate and difficult. I like the word for difficult. Difficult. This narrow way is confined. It's narrow. It's tough. It's hard. You must pay attention or you'll lose your way easily. False doctrine will creep in and draw you. Difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, if you go back and you look at some common words, and first of all, there's two different gates. There's a wide gate that leads to a wide path of destruction. There's a narrow gate, which means Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no way to the Father except through him. But once we enter the gate, this is where most people try to stop. This is where they stop preaching. They forget that the Bible says, make disciples of all nations teaching the ways of God. This is what we're doing right here. That once you go through Jesus, it has only begun as in kindergarten Christianity. Now there is a walk of faith all the days of your life. And the difficult, difficult is the way that leads to life. Difficult. Confined. Constricted. Oh, you Christians just don't like to have no fun. You know what? Whatever it was that you used to do in your life, I've been told that, oh, you old stick in the mud, you this and that. No, I'm on the confined, narrow path. You see, I can't do anything. See, Jesus said this when people spoke, I only do what I hear my father say. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody just got that. 
I only do what I hear my father say. And I hear my father saying very clearly in his word, if you ain't ever heard the voice of God, it is written that thou shalt not hang. Now I put that thou shalt not in there. I thought it was fancy, but forgive me for that. But he says, come out from among them. Separate yourself as I've called you to do. Be ye separate, not isolated. For if I isolate, I can't preach to the gospel that they may come into the kingdom of God. But I don't participate in what they do. I stand for righteousness and I speak truth that they may see truth. They already see error that they may make a choice by the free will that God has given them. But I must stay on the narrow path. If I come off the narrow path, lest I lose my way, how can I lead anyone to Christ? Oh, y'all hear what I'm saying? Because see, here's how it works. Is that a lot of times when people all heck starts breaking loose in their life, let's just call it what it is, all hell breaks loose in their life. Then what they do is the phone starts to, will you pray for me, put you on your prayer list, this and that, in which when everything, what they thought was good, which was a very deceptive work of the enemy, they didn't want to hear nothing about this. Now all of a sudden they want something to do with Jesus. Let me read that to you again. Narrow is the gate. And now I'm moving down to verse 14. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. There are few who find it. GPS, as my brother Mitchell used to say, God positioning saints. You must be led by the Holy Spirit of God. There's too many people trying to lead God. There's too many people that once they say that prayer, if indeed there was even a conversion, if there was a heart transplant that are trying to lead God, which many times that's the evidence that nothing happened. You have a false conversion. Because something happened whenever I truly sat up in my bed that night and I said, Lord Jesus, I'll follow you, I'll serve you. I don't care what anybody says. There was a convicting power of the Spirit of God in me that though there was alcohol in my refrigerator, I couldn't touch it. Oh, brother, here we go again. You're talking about alcohol. The Lord don't have you. Let Jesus drank wine. Show me the scripture. Send it to me. Send it to me. He made it. Now, show me the scripture and research it out. Which one is fermented drink and which one is grape juice? Because it calls all of them wine. Sometimes in the Old Testament, it, it, it calls it, uh, oh, I don't even remember. kind of went blank. But it specifies that it is uh, different that it's different. I'm not saying one way or another. I'm not telling you anything. If you're angry about what I just said, that you've got a problem with God and you've got a problem with the Word of God. Jesus said to be of a sound mind, be soberly minded. The book of Ephesians said this. He said that, that be not drunk with wine, and there you go. Well, Coach, see, I can drink a little. I don't get drunk when I drink a little. Well, let me ask you, why are you drinking it? Well, it's good for my heart. No, you need a new heart. <laughs> let me help you a little bit right there. You need a new heart. I'm not saying you're going to hell because you had a drink. What I am telling you is that when I drank, that I drank because I wanted to relax. I wanted to sit around and chill out. And God is sitting there saying, I'm supposed to be number one in your life. My word's not enough to get the anxiety out of you. So you've got to have a cold beer. Or you've got to have a glass of this or a glass of that. Now you answer to God. You don't answer to me. I'm just speaking to you from my perspective of what I see in the word of God and what I've dealt with. Amen. And I don't know why we went on that little side rabbit trail right there. I guess because I'm on the narrow path. The rabbit trails are pretty narrow. But there's some things that need to be dealt with. There's some compromise. There's some things that people are watching on TV. You've heard me say it before. There's some things that you're listening to. And you can argue all day long. I'm not into the argument. But, Coach, I listen to music. doesn't have no cuss words in it. Don't talk about running around cheating. Nobody's dog getting shot. Nothing like that. Whatever. Okay. Do you really have enough time in your day when the Bible says pray without ceasing to be thinking about the things of the world? Even, let's just go ahead and give you that and say they're not bad. But my Bible says the world is evil. It's adulterous. Friends of the world is being adulterer against God. So do you really have time? Are you so high up there in your walk with God that you need to take a break and, and play with the world a little bit? I know I'm not. I know that those things of the world have an influence. My Bible says that bad morals corrupt good character. I know that I have to choose between a, a song that doesn't have anything bad in it, but does not glorify my God, nor does the lifestyle of the ones who wrote it and sing it, that I don't have time for it. I'd rather listen to something that says, Glory to God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus. And if you would just cut some of those things out and replace it with Jesus, you'd be amazed what would happen in your life. And beginning with Psalm 18, God hears your prayer if we believe that. If we believe that. Difficult is the way. Confined. Tough. Which leads to life. And few find it. Now praise God. Thank you to Jesus. Thank you to Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. I, I've got something else to share with you. 
And you know what? I've done what God has told me to do. And I'm going to stop right there because I know these videos on Facebook can get pretty long or whatever. I am asking you to share, but I am asking you to go back and read Matthew 7. And I'm asking you to go back and consider that path. Consider the way. Consider when you're at work. Consider when you're at school. Consider in what you're doing with your life. And consider, is that the narrow path or is that the wide path? Are you doing, let me, let me help you, let me define this. Are you doing what everybody else does? Or are you doing what the Word of God says to do? Which is, just define it for you. Are you on purpose switching your signal to the Word of God? Are you on purpose setting your mind and your affections on things above, not on things beneath? Because if you're not doing it on purpose, by default, you're in the world. That's what the Bible says. Difficult is the way. He who endures to the end, Matthew 24, shall be saved. Endurance as a race. You know, some of you understand a little bit about track. Go out there and run the mile with people chasing you down and trying to outrun you and take your medal and take you. Go out there and run it. Go out there and run two miles. Go run a marathon. It's a race of endurance. You can't stop running. You've got to pay attention, and you've got to push when you don't feel like pushing. Coach, sounds like works. Yep. When you come through the gate, and you know what you've been redeemed from, and you realize what the blood of Jesus has done for you, you'll have no problem. You'll have no problem working a little bit for Jesus. You have no problem getting up and saying, you know, I don't feel like it, but i got to give me a word today. You have no problem saying, I don't feel like it. I'd like to watch the football game. No, I'm going to think on things above. I'm going to pray a little bit. Because here's why. Because I believe the Psalm 18. I believe the word of God. I believe Thessalonians that says pray without ceasing. I believe in Psalms where it says that God hears me when I pray. I believe it because I believe it. Man, I, this is too good a deal. I can't let it go. i got to do this. i got to do this. So the real problem that we have, and we'll be coming back with another message soon. Uh, me and Shemaine are going to be doing one over prayer and fasting and concerning the body. And we both like to somewhat, I know you can't tell by looking, take care of ourselves a little bit. But because we believe this is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if we're going to preach the gospel to live to be a ripe old age and be healthy, then we have a responsibility no different than you have to take care of the church building. That's not the church, but the building you gather in with the saints. You take care of it. You take out the trash. You vacuum the floors. You wipe things down. You mow the grass. You weed it a little bit. So we have a responsibility to do that. But if we truly believe that God is with us, we truly believe that he's just right there, a whisper away. If we truly believe he hears our prayer, if we truly believe the word of God, this says to pray without ceasing. If we're not doing it, that is a sign of unbelief. That's where I was going before I went on that other rabbit trail. That's a sign of unbelief. And you need to fight against it. Because I want to give you an encouraging word, and I'm not going to look it up. You can look it up. There's a man that has a boy that's all jacked up with demons, and he has to have that, that, that demon cast out. And, and I think it was the one, I'm not sure, but you can go back and look at it, that the, the disciples tried and they couldn't. And, and the Lord said to him, he says, um, do you believe? And the man says, yes, I believe. But he turns around and then he got honest with God because he realized God already knows he's lying. He said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. So can I pray with you as we shut this thing down? Can I do that? Because we all are faced with the same thing. We're all in the same boat if you've chosen to come through the gate. And if not, then come through the gate. We can find this difficult way. We can follow this difficult way, this confined path that Jesus has given us. But we've got to stand up and stand out. The whole purpose of the brethren coming together, whether it be through Facebook, on these messages, whether it be the gatherings, whatever it be, the whole purpose is, is that we sharpen as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens the countenance of his friend. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless your holy name. I praise your holy name and I worship you. I magnify you. I glorify you. I lift your name on high. You're holy, righteous, and good. There is no God like my God. There's no Savior like my Savior. There's no Messiah like my Messiah. There's no king like my king. Lord God, help our unbelief. Lord God, unleash the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord God, that faith would arise, oh God, in the name of Jesus. God, if that one watching is not born again, that they would drop to their knees and say, Jesus, you are the Son of God. You are the Messiah. You are the Lord. Forgive me. Cleanse me with your precious blood. Heal me, Lord God. 
And Lord God, you are the Son of God that died on the cross, if only it was for me. And I'm asking you and inviting you to sit upon the throne of my heart. But Lord God, when it's time to rise up, I'm asking for a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit that you may lead me into all truth and righteousness. It's not just to come into gate, but I need leadership on this path, on this confined, difficult way. Oh, Lord God, birth that faith in me, Lord God, that only comes from you. God, I surrender myself and I lay myself on your altar, Romans 12, 1, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Lord God Almighty, I'm a water hose. Plug me in, Lord God, to the spigot and take water to the dying world. Take the word, which is the water, which flows from the, the, the rock that Moses struck, that watered the people. For if you knew who it was who asked you for a drink, you would ask me for a drink and you'd never thirst again, Jesus said to the woman at the well. Lord God, give us this living water. Lead us into all truth. You said, follow me continually in your word, indicating that we are to follow the word, for you are the word that became flesh, John 1, 14. Father, we thank you, Lord. Unleash your faith and by the power of the Holy Spirit. That one listed, Lord God, the sick in their soul that needs to be born again. Lord God, let faith arise and let them rise up in the name of Jesus. Let them drop and rise up when you pick them up. Lord God, David laid there, Lord. But when it was time, he got up, cleaned himself up, and anointed himself with all the Holy Spirit and began to do that which he was born to do, rule. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, that we are to rule men, husbands in our homes, that we are to stand, oh God, under the authority of Christ, not as a dictator, but through the love of the word of God and for a love of God, God will shed his love abroad in us for one another in Jesus' name. Lord God, heal that one watching, Lord. The symptoms in their body, the sickness in their body, we curse disease in Jesus' name. That God, you are the healer, Lord God. We pray for miracles and healings. Two different things, guys. Miracles cannot be explained by science. They happen now. But healings are available to all. Lord God, have your way, whether it be a miracle, whether it be a healing in Jesus' name. Lord God, birth their faith, O oh God. Let the seed that is in the hand that has not germinated be planted in the soil of the Spirit that it may grow, Lord God, and bring forth a harvest of the kingdom of God, demonstrating the fruit of the kingdom of God. According to Matthew 7, a tree is known by its fruit. And the only the fruit of the kingdom of God will remain. The others will be cut down and thrown in the fire. Unleash your faith in us, O God. Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Loose the faith inside that one watching in Jesus' name. Heal that body. Restore that relationship, Lord God, that has been destroyed by demons in Jesus' name. Now, Father, we thank you, we bless you, and we praise you. And we take authority to those that you've given us over, Lord, that we bind the forces of darkness, the plots, plans, and schemes of the devil, and we command you to leave, Satan. Leave that one's life that they may be born again and saved and make a choice for Jesus. We tear down walls of Jericho that people may be able to see and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit of God. Father God, in Jesus' mighty, mighty name, we praise you and we worship you. Now, brothers and sisters, I thank you for watching. This is Coach Shelby, and you might have thought it was a little bit weird about the binding and the canceling the assignment of the devil. I can't specifically do that for you, but you can take a hold of that and come into agreement in your life. You can do that if you're truly born again and saved. The word says that we have authority to stomp on scorpions and serpents. It says that. So you have the right to do that. The word says that whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. The word says that. That we have a right. It says that when a strong man is stronger than the strong man comes in, which is the Holy Ghost, that he will bind the strong man and plunder his goods. That's talking about the kingdom of darkness. We have the authority to do that. The problem with most Christians today is that they've walked up to the gate, but they haven't got on the track yet. They haven't followed the confined path that God calls us to, the difficult path. Search a matter out. Dig these things out. Receive this word. And you guys be blessed in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. In Jesus' name. God bless you guys. Praise the Lord.